walked in the door, have to come up, sing a duet. Oh. <laughs> at Rensselaer, you know, when we hit, turn around, shake hands at Rensselaer, I said, turn around, slap somebody in the face. <laughs> but nobody did that. <laughs> Isaiah 41. Okay, there are some places in the Bible, a couple of places, where uh, the Lord uh, basically just told the, writer, uh, the, um, the individual to record what he's going to say. So it's God speaking directly. It's like he's, he's not uh, delegated the authority. Uh, Job 38 to 42 is one of those places. And Isaiah 41, or 40 actually, to 48 are, is another place. And so these are kind of the... Uh, quick insights into the personality of God when you get it directly from him. So Isaiah 41, verse 21. And let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us to understand this. I pray that our thoughts, our minds can really think through this, that this would be a real blessing to start off this year. And I pray that you'd help us to understand uh, the amazing uh, hidden secrets of the Word of God, that uh, we might be enamored, we might be in awe, we might adore uh, the masterpiece that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Isaiah 41, 21. So the way this, this is setting here, if you can imagine uh, Jesus Christ showing up at the United Nations, you know, the usual nonsense, that's what UN stands for, and uh, gives a speech and so here's what he would say, Isaiah 41, 21, produce your cause. Say it to the Lord, bring forth your strong reason, say it to the king of Jacob. Oh, that'd be a smack right there, king of Jacob. And then he says, let them bring them forth, let them all the nations bring them forth and show us, us the Godhead, what shall happen. And then he says, let them show the former things what they be, that we may consider them and know the, that, or the latter end of them, and declare us things for to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we, we Godhead, may know that ye are gods, yea, do good do, or do evil, that we may be dismayed and behold it together. And then his conclusion to them is, behold, ye are of nothing, and your work of naught. And abomination is he that chooseth you. And then he would say, smile and have a good day. <laughs> okay. Uh, chapter 42, verse 8. I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things are come to pass. And new things do I declare before... They spring forth, I tell you of them. Okay, 43, chapter 43, verse 9. We're just hitting the highlights. The Lord is trash talking, showing his power, what he can do. Predict the future in detail. Put it in writing. And then just see what happens. Let all the nations be gathered, Isaiah 43, 9. Together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified. Or let them hear and say it is truth. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. There it is, the I am. I am he. In John 8, that's why they want to crucify Jesus. He said, I'm the I am. It's interesting. The I am at the front of the Bible, the very first time you have um, uppercase letters, you'll see the first time is at Exodus 3.14 where Moses asked God who he is. He said, I am that I am. All uppercase, five words, and then he closed that, uh, that verse with I am. So you got three I ams, all uppercase, seven words, coincidence, uppercase, three I ams, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. The last uppercase letters are found in the back of the Bible. King of kings and Lord of lords. Seven words. The I am. 25 times that occurs in the Bible. The I am. The Bible is a fascinating book. 
He says, before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Isaiah 46, verse 9. Isaiah 46, verse 9, he says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God. There is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So I want to look at that throughout the Bible, and I, I, if you've read the Bible for many years, some of this will make sense to you. If you haven't, uh, it may not make some sense, but the God of the Bible is much smarter than we are. Uh, but basically what I'm going to show is the, the orchestra conductor of the Bible who's behind the scenes has orchestrated this book amazingly, taken 40-some men, and boy, this book fits in unity, and I'm going to take some things in the front of the Bible and compare it to some things in the back of the Bible. Uh, the God of the Bible is not limited by time. He is outside of time, just like the computer technician is outside of the computer. But yet our God, our God is always present tense. That's the I am. I am that I am. Not I was that I was. Not I will be that I will be. I am. The God of the Bible is always present tense. But yet he reviews, he reveals the future to man. And the power of God is revealed by his prophecies and then the fulfillment of them. And the future of the earth, it was revealed in the Bible, is it's going to get worse before it gets better. The future for the believer is pretty uplifting. I've read the last chapter, and there's a wedding. Earth is preparing for war. Heaven is preparing for a wedding. And just that in itself is amazing. And so we're going to kind of enjoy the Bible, hopefully enjoy the Bible this morning about uh, things that uh, the Lord has uh, planned in the future by studying some things in the past. We're going to look at the Bible, how it's laid out. Now, the way a person can prepare for the future and kind of see the future is uh, you have three uh, op options for you, three elements for you. One is history. Now, history is questionable. You've got to be careful about history because history in the history books is usually lies agreed upon by the elite. Okay, so we've got to keep that in mind. But history tells you about what happened in the past, and it tells you about what's going to go in the future. Ecclesiastes 1.9 says, that which hath been is that which shall be. And what do we learn from history is that man don't learn from history. And so man repeats it. The other element that we can learn about the future is science. Science and the Bible are completely compatible. Science is found two times in the Bible. Daniel understood science, Daniel 1.4. But then there's a fake science in 1 Timothy 6.20 that we're warned about. Science falsely so-called. That's incompatible with the Bible. That's what Neil deGrasse Bison, uh, Tyson and company intermingle science with pseudoscience, not telling the deceived students the difference. Science is you and I learning about the natural world through our observation. And what do we learn in science? Uh, one of the second laws of thermodynamics is the law of entropy. The law of entropy is that everything falls apart someday. Energy always decreases. That eventually is going to stop unless an outside force makes it go again. That's entropy. That's all around us. In other words, history reveals that man falls apart. The world's falling apart. America's dying. That's entropy. The church is dying. That's entropy. That's science. That's compatible with Scripture. We learn from that. If I was an evolutionist and I wanted to have a Lamborghini, I'd go to a junkyard and buy a Yugo, find one of them Yugos, and it's going to evolve into a Lamborghini someday. It's just that I won't be old enough to enjoy it. Okay, science is another thing that we can tell about the future, but obviously the most accurate is Scripture. The scripture that God has forgiven to us. Now, the master person of God is the Lord Jesus Christ. The masterpiece of God is that blessed book. 
Now, in the Old Testament, God made himself more visible to the Jews. He had the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud, so he would directly intervene. He would directly give them instructions. They could go to the Urim and Thummim and get direct orders. In the New Testament, God's more behind the scenes. Often coincidence is nothing more than God remaining anonymous. In the Old Testament, there was a physical kingdom. It's called the kingdom of heaven. In the New Testament, it's a kingdom of God. It's a spiritual kingdom. So in the New Testament, we live by faith, not by sight. In the Old Testament, sight was more available. In the New Testament, it's more of the behind the scenes. In the Old Testament, God had chose somebody physical to be the custodians of the scriptures. If you would turn to uh, Luke 24, the custodians of the scriptures under the Old Testament uh, were the Levites. The Levites was a special tribe chosen by God to be the ones who actually hand wrote the Bible. Old Testament, I say the Bible. When I say the Bible, the Jewish Bible, okay, I have right here a, what's called a complete Jewish Bible. Okay, so this is a Jewish Bible where they translate it into English. But what I like about this is that it shows how the Jewish people put the arrangements of the books of the Old Testament in a special order. And God is the one that laid that out for them. Ours are laid out differently because God kept some things secret for 4,000 years and he started revealing them to Paul and God behind the scenes was starting to, oh, we'll do this, we'll do this, we'll do this, we'll do this. And nobody can really take the credit for the New Testament. The Catholic Church tries to take credit, but the credit doesn't belong to them. It belongs to God, the invisible orchestrator of his word. In Luke 24, you'll have Jesus Christ where he gives what's called the canon of the Old Testament scriptures. This is the Bible that he used, that he read, that he believed. And it says this, he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses. That's the first category, the law of Moses. And then it says, and in the prophets. That's the second category. And in the Psalms. So in this Jewish Bible, if you get to the table of contents, you will see that they lay it out exactly as Jesus Christ lays it out. The law and the prophets, as far as it's laid out. So the first one is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That matches ours. That's where the Judeo-Christian ethics come in play. And then if you look at the next verse in Luke 24, this is what's called the scriptures. The scriptures. So in this Jewish Bible, in the front of it, you'll have the law, first five. Then in here, it's got the prophets, exactly as Jesus said it, the prophets. Now, here's the list that they have in their prophets. Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings. And then it has... The latter prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then the 12, Hosea to Malachi. So that's how they have it laid out. And then the last one is Psalms. They sometimes call that writings. Now, that's not limited to our book called Psalms. They have Psalms, Proverbs, Job, the scrolls, which would be Song of Solomon, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and then Chronicles. So if you would go to Chronicles and see what is the last words to a Jewish person in their Bible. It's not the same as ours because ours is laid out, arranged differently for a specific reason. And you'll see the, mag the majesty of God when we go through this. In, in 2 Chronicles 36, verse 23 there's a question at the end of the verse and a statement. The question, you can see the context. He's talking about the house of Jerusalem. And then he asked the question, who is there among you of all his people, Judah? What does he tell them? The Lord his God be with him and let him go up. The last words that a Jew would read in his Bible is go back to Jerusalem. 
It's the last words they read. Go back to Jerusalem. Go back to... If you ever cross one of these black Hebrews that says they're Hebrews, don't even argue with them. Don't even take time with them. All, all you have to do is ask them, what are you doing here? Go back to Israel. You're supposed to. That's what your Bible says. Go back to Israel. <laughs> and that, that will get them to think about that. Okay, and so that's, that's as far as the Jewish Bible. The King James Bible has the same 39 books that the Jewish Bible has. Jesus Christ did not approve of the Apocrypha. And so when a church forces that in, uh, they are going contrary to Jesus Christ. So in the New Testament, God has been more indirect, invisible under the kingdom of God. And amazingly, I have a book here that's fascinating. And this book is laid out in a different arrangement than this book. And so sometimes we study the Bible, most of the time we study the Bible verse by verse, where you're looking at, you're going into the forest, looking at the tree, looking at the leaves, looking at the plants, looking at all the details. But sometimes when you do that, you miss the big picture. So there's times you've got to step back and look at the entire scenery. The, first, the summer after I graduated from high school, Okay, I took a motorcycle trip. I went out to uh, the northwest, 6,000 miles in, four, in 16 days. I had a sore rumpums. Okay, and 6,000 miles, so we went up to the northwest. And then the second summer, we went to the, uh, a friend and I we went to the southwest, Grand Canyon. And boy, when you just see the scenic tour. Now, there's, there's something fascinating. Maybe somebody has done it. Maybe you haven't. In California, you come down through the Redwoods, and there's a place called the Avenue of the Giants. Has anybody ever taken that scenic tour? I did it twice, once on a motorcycle. So you're weaving in or out of this road for about 30 miles or so, and you're just gradually you're enjoying, and you're seeing this tree that you don't want to hit because it's bigger than a bike. I mean, the tree's bigger than a car. One of those trees, the General Sherman, they have it cut out where you can drive your car in it and then take a picture inside the tree, the car's in the tree. I was on my motorcycle uh, on, that, on that trip, and it's just a fast, it just does something to the spirit, just driving through there. At the beginning of this avenue of the giants, there's great big Paul Bunyan and the blue ox. And it's, uh, Paul Bunyan is over a 50-foot statue made out of wood and stucco and all that stuff. And then the blue ox is about a 40-foot statue. And when you stop there, and if your kids are goofing around, you know, and you tickle Paul Bunyan's toe, somebody in the, uh, in the building has a, has a speaker out there, and they say, oh, don't do that. And you can talk to Paul Bunyan. It's a really a fun experience. It's a blast for kids. And you, you punch his toe and say, oh, don't do that. That hurts my foot. And so that's the avenue of the giants. It's just fascinating. If you're ever out in California, that's something. I wouldn't waste time in San Francisco. I didn't go there. I went to the avenue of the giants, went to the redwoods. I mean, it's just the redwoods are taller and not as huge as the sequoias. The sequoias are about 50 feet shorter, but huge. It just does something to see the creation of God, the scenic tour, or as I come through Colorado, I hit the mountains, Pikes Peak, driving up that motorcycle up the top of Pikes Peak. When you see a mountain, it's just sitting there. But yet it says, come here, come here, come here. And you got to climb a mountain. You get to the top of that mountain, you see another mountain. And it says, come here, come here. you got to climb that next one. You just can't help from doing it. But when you're on the beaches in uh, California, you're laying on the beach and the water's moving. And you're walking barefoot. You're earthing. You're connecting with her. And there's a very healthy thing to do that, to walk around barefoot. Okay, and so, but when you see that water, it's constantly moving, and the water makes you feel peaceful. The mountains are not moving, but it drives you to action. The water is moving, but it drives you to peace. And I'm looking forward today to sitting, laying by the river, flowing out of the New Jerusalem on Mount Zion. Looking forward to that day. But you see, as we step back and look at the Bible from a scenic tour, that's what I want to do this morning, where we just kind of, I'm going to be traveling 100 mile an hour going through this, but we're kind of going through the scenic tour, and I'm going to show you some of the amazing how the Bible, meaning the King James Bible, is arranged differently than this Jewish Bible. Why is that? It's because 
They didn't know about the judgment seat of Christ. The Jews didn't know about the Godhead. They didn't know about salvation by grace. They didn't know about a lot of things. And that was all revealed to the Apostle Paul. And then God, behind the scenes, laid out the Bible exactly as he wanted. In the front of the Bible, you've got seven books. In the back of the Bible, there are seven churches. Those seven churches parallel the seven books in the front of the Bible. Ephesus was a church that left its first love. In Genesis, Adam left his first love. And it ended up in a coffin in Egypt. In the second church, Smyrna was a suffering church. In Exodus, Israel was suffering in the land of Egypt. The third church was Pergamos. It was a church that was a worldly church. In Leviticus, the word holy is found over 90 times, and it has leprosy right in the middle of that book. And the Pergamos church didn't have the holiness that they were supposed to have. The fourth church was Thyatira. It was an extreme worldly church also, but it was a church where... In Numbers, the children of Israel wandered around the wilderness, and many Christians in Lad and Thyatira were wandering around. The next church is Sardis. It was a dead church. It was a church that had unfinished work. It was imperfect. Deuteronomy is a second giving of the law. It's a second giving of holiness under the Old Testament. That's what the the Sardis church did not do. The next church, anybody who studies those churches know that Philadelphia was a good one. Philadelphia is a great church. I mean, it's a great church time. It was a time where the word of God was open, open door. And guess what the sixth book in the Bible is? Joshua. When they had great victories under the Old Testament covenant. Joshua is the Old Testament of the New Testament, Jesus. It's the same name. It's spelled differently, different translation. From Hebrew to English is Joshua. From Greek to English is Jesus. In Acts 7.45, it says that Jesus brought the children of Israel into the land of Canaan. But we know it was Joshua. But that's the word, Jesus. So you have Jesus, the, the sixth book in the Bible. The sixth is the number for man. And that has Joshua. you got six letters in the name. And that's a picture of Jesus, the first man that's recorded in the Bible is Joshua. Great time, great victorious time. Philadelphia age in America, many people got saved. Many great revivals, many great church movements started in Philadelphia. And then what happens? Laodicea. What happens in the Old Testament? Joshua judges. Judges that did that which was right in their own eyes. Judges. Laodicea, what are Christians doing? They're doing that which is right in their own eyes. But what follows Judges is a very small book called Ruth. It's a Gentile woman who gets redeemed. What's that kind of sound like for us born-again believers in the New Testament? What takes place after Laodicea when everything falls apart? We have a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. A kinsman redeemer takes the church away. What follows that in the Old Testament? First Samuel, a series of books about kings. The first king was a bad king, a type of the Antichrist, Saul. The second king was a type of Jesus Christ, the millennium. Saul is the tribulation, and David is the millennial time period. We have a pre-tribulation, pre-millennial, laid out chronologically arranged in the King James Bible. Not all that was hid to the Old Testament people. They didn't know about that. That was the mysteries given to the Apostle Paul. And you can go with Deuteronomy again, where Deuteronomy is a duet of the second giving of the law and the fifth book in the New Testament. Deuteronomy is the fifth book in the Bible. In the New Testament is the book of Acts. That's a second opportunity for Israel to receive their Messiah. When you read Acts, you'll see God robbed Peter to pay Paul. Peter's the main character beginning. Paul becomes in play and Peter's out of the picture. It goes from Jerusalem to uh, Antioch of Syria. It goes from Israel to the church, from the Jews to the Gentiles. Acts, that's what Acts does. He lays it out that way. It's the second giving of the law. If you go back to 1 Samuel or 2 Chronicles, you've got those six books. You have Saul as the type of the Antichrist, David as the type of Christ. Then later on, you'll have Ahab, a type of the Antichrist. You'll even find Jezebel back in Revelation. Something over here is found over here. 
So you got Ahab's a type of Christ, or a type of the Antichrist, and Elijah, type of the, the two witnesses in the tribulation. Elijah even shows up in James chapter 5. He shows up in Revelation chapter 11. Here he is in the Old Testament. He shows up again in Revelation. That's a fascinating thing, the way this book's laid out. Now if you go, go back to Chronicles, in our Bible we have Chronicles, so the Jew is told to go back. And so what is that told? In, our, in modern history, in 1917, Lord Balfour of England ordered the Jews to go back to Palestine. 1917, that Jew didn't go back, so he had World War II to make them go back. 1948, the, Israel became a nation. Greatest miracle since the resurrection of Christ. So in, in 2 Chronicles, Jew go back to Israel. What is Ezra? Rebuilding the temple. What are they getting ready to do? In Nehemiah, what are they doing? In Nehemiah, rebuilding the city. But in order for this to progress further, you've got the next book, Esther. What happens in Esther? A Gentile queen is removed and replaced by a Jewish queen. Sounds like a rapture to me. I don't know about you. Where the church is taken out and he's got to pick up with a Jew. What follows Esther? Job. Job has 42 chapters matching 42 months of the Great Tribulation. Job is persecuted by di Satan directly. And the Jews will be persecuted just by, by Satan directly, according to Revelation 12. What happens in that? James chapter 5. Guess who is going to be a testimony to the Jews in the Tribulation? Job. You'll find Job in James chapter 5. It's a fascinating book. What follows Job? Well, you got a post-tribulation rapture at the end of Job where his kids are resurrected, plus 10 more. And then you go to Psalm 1. Psalm 1, you have the Antichrist and Christ paralleled. Psalm 2, at the beginning of Psalm 2, the, the heathen rage together against the Lord, Armageddon. The Christ comes in, kiss the, ki kiss the son because he's the king. This Bible is laid out in a pre-tribulation Premillennial. Why? Because science shows us that everything falls apart and the church has fallen apart. You see, if I was a post millennial, post millennial believes that the church is going to get stronger, 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 and then Christ comes and rules the kingdom. Are you serious? It's falling apart. Your car falls apart. What's going to maintain your car? An outside force outside of the car has to do something to keep entropy delayed. What's going to keep this world together? An outside force called the Creator has to step in to keep entropy at bay. But what it does, it takes a real quick downfall. In Esther, you have Haman, a type of the Antichrist. You give a man enough rope, he hangs himself. And the Antichrist gets killed at the end of the tribulation. Then if you go to Isaiah, as chronologically as we're running through the Bible, Isaiah is the largest book in the Bible with chapters. Isaiah is a Bible inside the Bible. It's got 66 chapters. Isaiah 1, verse 2, Hear, O earth, give ear, O heavens. Hear, O heavens, give ear, O earth. I got it reversed. Matching Genesis 1, in the beginning God created heaven and the earth. Isaiah 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. Isaiah saw the Lord in the 6th chapter, Joshua, 6th book. He saw the Lord. Joshua is a picture of Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, is a prediction of John the Baptist, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Well, where does he show up? The 40th book of the Bible, Matthew chapter 3. Laid out as pretty as could be. Isaiah 66, verse 22, mentions a new heaven and new earth. Where do we find that? In Revelation, the 66th book of the Bible, in chapter 21 and 22. Isaiah is a, book, a Bible inside the Bible. Then you, go to the, the, you start with Isaiah. He warned Israel about forsaking God. Jeremiah warned Judah about forsaking God. What follows Jeremiah? Five chapters of Lamentations. It's a description of the Jew in the tribulation time period and historically of Israel being conquered by Babylon. But in, in Lamentations, you'll see that they're in the land of Uz, just like no, Job was in the land of Uz. That's what's called Edom in the Bible. That's Petra. That's where the Jew needs to run to try to find sanctuary during the tribulation time period. After 
after a lamentation, you have Ezekiel, a priest, to Israel and during captivity. Daniel, a prophet, to Israel during captivity. And then you got the, the minor prophets. You've got Hosea all the way to Malachi. How does that end in Malachi? What do we have at the end of Malachi? We have a prediction of the son of righteousness coming back, S-U-N. And what followed that? What's with that same chapter? Moses shows up. Elijah shows up, Malachi 4. Where do they show up? Revelation 11. What's the last word in Malachi in our Bible? What's the last word we read in the Old Testament? The word curse. It's the last word. If you're honest about yourself and you read the Old Testament, you'll recognize, man, I am under a curse. But how can, what's the remedy for that? Well, live on cloud nine. How are you going to do that? Go to the ninth book in the New Testament, Galatians, got nine letters. Go to chapter 5, verse 22, and it has the fruit of the Spirit. But if you go to chapter 3, verse 13, who has redeemed me from the curse of the law? Galatians 3, 13, that's 39. Who's redeemed me from the curse of the law? Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. That book's a fascinating book. You got to kind of sit back and look at that thing. In, in Ezekiel chapter 10, he introduced four cherubims. Those four cherubims are found in Revelation 4 verse 7. But in Revelation 4 verse 7 and Ezekiel, the four cherubims have four faces that lay out with the gospel story. The first one is a lion. Matthew writes about Jesus Christ being the king of Israel, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And then the next one is a face of an ox. That's a servant. And that's what Mark portrayed Jesus Christ. He came to be minister, to minister, not to minister unto. And then Luke portrays him to be a man, the son of man. You'll find that all through Luke. That's the third cherub. And the fourth one is eagle. That portrays Jesus Christ as God Almighty because the eagle flies high. In, and all that's laid out as pretty as could be. Then you got Paul's writings. Who's this character? Paul. God hid a lot of things. He started revealing them to Paul. 4,000 years he hid these things, and he took this, Paul, this man named Paul. Saul was his original name, and he writes 13 letters to the bride of Christ. 13 in a row. They're laid out chronologically, not according to time. They're laid out to growth in grace. Romans, very large letter, 16 chapters. Who's going to write a letter like that today? 1 Corinthians, 16 chapters. 2 Corinthians, 13 chapters. And Galatians, 6, and then 6, and 4, and 4. And then you got 5, and then it gets smaller. Why? It's because in this Christian life, very few Christians get here to Philemon. What's Philemon? That's the ultimate where God wants us to recognize we're servants of Jesus Christ. In Philemon, how's that work in Philemon? And when you read Paul's writings, you'll see that this laid out. And what does Paul tell us in that second to the last book? In Titus 2.13, we're looking for the blessed hope. He's telling look for the blessed hope, pre-tribulation rapture. But what's the next book about? It's about somebody who ran away from their master, and Paul wants them to go back to their master. What nation ran away from their master? Israel. And what's God wanting them to do? Come back to their master. What follows Philemon? Hebrews. Hebrews follows Philemon. And then you have four men who are apostles to the circumcision. James, Peter, John, and Jude. All pick up where God has some unfinished business with Israel. Hebrews is written to the Jews in the last days. James says to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Peter says to the, one, the, the uh, strangers who are scattered because they're scattered throughout the whole world. Fascinating. Not only that, are they scattered, but the Muslims are going throughout the whole world too. Why is that? Because of beheading is the death sentence during the tribulation. And you've got to have a religion that still believes in beheading. And they're going to do that all around the world. James is doctrinally. And then you get to the last book of your Bible, a fascinating book, Revelation. He sums it all up in Revelation where you got the first three chapters, you got seven churches. What happens to those seven churches? Chapter 4 and 5, they are raptured out. Pre-tribulation rapture. Who shows up after that? The guy on the white horse. A fake guy on the white horse. The Antichrist. So you've got the Antichrist from chapter 6 to chapter 19. The first time the word Antichrist is found in the Bible is in 1 John 
and another time a second John. Why? Because all that's dealing with Israel. God's got unfinished business with Israel. I'm not worried about a covenant. I've got the last testament. I'm in the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. Born again people have got that promise. And then at the end of uh, Revelation 19, you've got Armageddon, chapter 20. You've got the devil bound, the resurrection of Israel, the millennium, the white throne judgment, the Maximus Bangus is at the end, not at the beginning. And then what shows up? New heaven, new earth. There's a marriage. We live happily ever after. This book's laid out like that. When you step back from this book, there's a scenic tour. Man, you can't enjoy. You you can enjoy all that. Now, there's other times we go right back in and we look at everything, every detail. But when you step back from this book, you've got to say, what a glorious God we have. Man, if, you, if you're not born again, you're going to miss out on the fun. Make sure you know Jesus Christ. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray. And I, I pray that you'd help us to really get that, understand that, and see the big picture of what you've done, what you've laid together, this glorious book that you've given us. You have the front from the back all placed together, like the Lord Jesus Christ said, amazingly. He said that um, as it was in the days of Noah, Genesis 6, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man, Revelation 20. Man, that book is amazing. It's a fascinating book. And I pray that you'd help us to be more intrigued with the Bible, that we might read it ourselves, love it, believe it, pray through it, beg the Spirit to explain it, and, do, and, and live in pleasure to thee. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen.